Well, good morning and a warm welcome to your service. It's uh, good to see you here, uh, everyone. And uh, I know there's some folk in the hall, so uh, I'll say hello to the folk in the hall. It's good to have you here with us as well. And uh, despite the restrictions, I hope everyone uh, enjoys being here and is able to, to worship God. Uh, let me uh, just run through the announcements again. Thank you for complying uh, with the restrictions would have, which have been put in place, of course, uh, to keep everyone safe. Uh, under new regulations issued by the government just this past week, everyone must wear a face covering when entering and exiting the building, apart from those who are exempt for medical reasons. Uh, but of course, we're still encouraging everyone uh, to wear a face covering throughout the service, again, just to keep everyone uh, safe. Please maintain that two metre distance between households at all times. Uh, and at the end of the service, just remain in your seat until one of the stewards uh, says it's okay to leave and they'll direct you out. If you'd like to be part of that COVID team uh, who uh, help get everything ready on a Sunday and uh, wipe the surfaces down afterwards, then speak to me or Trevor Smith. And if anyone develops COVID symptoms, uh, perhaps you'd tell Alan Bridal. Uh, as you came in, you will have seen copies of the annual report for 2019. If you didn't uh, pick up a copy earlier, uh, you might take one away with you. Uh, these, of course, should have been distributed uh, earlier in the year, in about March or April, but of course, with the COVID, they've been delayed. But uh, take them away and read them. The midweek Bible study, it's on Wednesday, uh, as usual, at 7.45. Let me encourage you to come. We're studying the Psalms and then praying, praying for the world. The world needs our prayers and uh, we're praying also for the extension of Christ's kingdom. So come along on Wednesday, please. And then in light of the disruption to uh, our services this year, the Congregational Committee recently agreed to a request that 10-month statements should be issued during November to update members of their FWO giving year to year. We used to do this every year, but we stopped a, a few years ago, but we decided uh, under these circumstances to uh, do it again. So given current circumstances, it would be helpful if at least some of these statements could be distributed directly by email. Uh, our finance team would therefore be grateful if members would print their email address in the back of their FWO envelope and leave it in the offering plates over the next few Sundays. Uh, alternatively, please email their treasurer uh, before the end of October. If you don't know Kevin's email, you can contact me and I can give it to you. Hard copies, of course, will be available for collection or distribution next month for members who don't have access to email or who'd prefer to receive a paper version. Those, I think, are all the announcements I need to make. Uh, we're here to worship God, and in Psalm 95, it says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Well, let's uh, sing to God's praise. We're going to sing a version of Psalm 95. It's let us sing to the God of salvation. I said last week, we've all got masks on so we can sing uh, out. Uh, there's no need to sing quietly. And somebody said, well, we've got masks on. There's no need to remain in our seats. So let's stand uh, together and uh, praise God. If you're able to stand, let's stand and we'll praise God together.
Let's uh, turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father, we bow before you to worship you and we praise you because you are God, our maker, who in the beginning made the heavens and the earth and all that they contain. You made the sky above and the earth below and the waters which cover the earth. You fill the sky with the sun and the moon and the stars and with birds that fly. You fill the earth with plants and flowers and trees and animals. You fill the seas with fish. And last of all, you made Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman. And so we praise you because you are God, our maker. We praise you because you are God, our provider, who provides us with all that we need day after day. You cause the sun to shine and the rain to fall and you make the crops grow in the fields and you provide us with our daily bread and with so much else you provide us with health and strength and work and rest with friends and family every good thing that we enjoy has come to us from you our loving heavenly father and so we praise you because you are god our provider and we praise you because you are God our Savior. You sent your one and only Son into the world to accomplish our salvation by his life and death and resurrection. You sent your Spirit into the world to enable us to receive this salvation through repentance and faith. And you gave us the church and your word and the sacraments and prayer to help us to persevere in the faith right to the very end of our lives. And so we praise you because you are God, our Savior. Heavenly Father, we confess with sorrow and shame that we are sinners who sin against you continually. We haven't loved you as we should with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. Instead of putting you first of all, we have put other things before you. Instead of Walking in your ways, we have gone astray. Instead of trusting in your fatherly care, we have been anxious about many things. Instead of living for Christ our Savior, we have so often lived to please ourselves. And so we confess that we are sinners. And we pray that you'll have mercy on us. And that you will forgive us our sins for the sake of Christ our Savior who loved us and who gave up his life for us. So for his sake, will you remove our sins from us as far as the east is from the west? Will you cast them into the depths of the ocean? Will you cover them up and blot them out and remember them no more? And will you help us by your spirit to say no to ungodliness and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for our Savior to come again. And help us to worship you today, despite the restrictions in place, despite the strange circumstances. Lift our thoughts to heaven and enable us to worship you today. And we ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we confess our sins, and having done so, hear the good news from Acts and Ephesians, where it says, Through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Thanks be to God for his kindness to us. I'm going to show that you some pictures now, the boys and girls, some pictures. Uh, here's the first one. Uh, these pictures, see if you can see what the connection is between them. So there's the first one. You can see it's a bit, it's a, it's a frog, isn't it? Uh, so there's the first picture. Here's the second one. Um, okay, it's a big bird. It's a kind of a pigeon. Uh, here's the, uh, the third picture. Uh, it's a roller coaster uh, somewhere in America. And uh, the final picture, this might... Uh, help you because uh, you might be familiar with this one uh, we've got the the cranes the harland and wolf uh, cranes i wonder uh, can you work out what the connection is um, it's maybe a wee bit difficult but i'll tell you because the last one gave it away we're thinking about goliath 
And uh, all of these different things are named Goliath. So the, the toad or the frog, it's, the, it's, a, it's a Goliath frog. Uh, the bird, the pigeon, it's called the Goliath pigeon. Uh, the roller coaster, it's a Goliath roller coaster. And then uh, the Koreans, one of them is, of course, Goliath, and the other one is, is Samson. Uh, here in Belfast today, we're thinking about the story of Goliath, the original Goliath, the very first Goliath was uh, big. That's why all these big things are named Goliath. The first Goliath was, was very big. Uh, he was uh, over nine feet tall, and so here he is, this, and he was a mighty soldier, and he's towering above everyone else. And in the Bible, it describes his armor, the helmet he wore, the armor that he wore around his body, and then his weapons, his javelin and his sword and everything else that he had. Uh, he was so tall, so strong, terrifying. Uh, he used to uh, frighten everyone. So we're thinking about Goliath today. Goliath was a Philistine, and uh, the Philistines were attacking God's people in the land of Israel. And... Uh, they were standing across from one another. So the Israelites were on the far side, and Goliath and the Philistines, they were on the other side. And every day, Goliath would come out, and he would stand in front of all the Philistines, and he'd call over to the Israelites saying, send out your best soldier, send out your champion to fight against me. And uh, Goliath would say, if he's able to beat me, then we will be your slaves, your servants. But if I beat him, well, then you're to serve us. And so every day he would come out and he would shout across. And the Israelites were terrified. Not one of them uh, wanted to go and fight Goliath because he was so tall, so strong, so scary. And you can imagine their knees knocking. Not even Saul, their king, who was uh, the tallest of the Israelites, wanted to go and fight Goliath. So what would they do? Because every day he was challenging them. Well, in the story, we go far away to Bethlehem, to the, uh, to the fields where David was minding the sheep. David was only probably a teenager, and he was a shepherd boy looking after his father's sheep. But one day his father said to him, go on up to the battle lines and see your brothers, because three of his brothers were fighting uh, for the Israelites in their army. Go and see how they're doing and bring back word and how they're doing. So David left the sheep and he went off, as his father told him, and went up to the, the front line to the battle to see what was happening. And he arrived just as Goliath was uh, issuing his challenge and shouting across, send out your best man, send out your best uh, soldier to fight against me. And uh, David heard Goliath and he saw how all the Israelites were afraid. And David said, well, hang on, I will fight against Goliath. I'm not afraid I will fight against Goliath. And so he went into the king, King Saul, and said, Saul, I will fight against Goliath. And Saul looked at this boy, this teenager, David, and said, you can't fight against him. You're only a, a young man, and uh, there's no way you'll be able to fight Goliath because he's been a mighty soldier since his youth. You won't be able to do it. And uh, David said, well, hang on. Whenever I'm working in the fields, minding my father's sheep. Sometimes a bear comes along, sometimes a lion comes along, and I'm able to fight against them and chase them away. So I'm able to fight against Goliath. I'll treat him just like I treat the bears and the lions who attack me when I'm minding the sheep. And so he set off to fight against Goliath. And Goliath, when he saw David coming, I suppose he was insulted. He says, what are you doing sending a boy to me uh, to fight against me? And he, uh, he said to David, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I'm going to tear you apart. Uh, just you wait. But David looked up at Goliath, this giant, and said, well, you come at me with all of your weapons, but I'm coming in the name of the Lord. And with that, he took a stone out of his bag, and he had his sling, and he uh, swung round and round and round with his sling, round his head, and he let the stone go, and it flew through the air. And of course, you know what happened, don't you? It landed, crash, into Goliath's head. 
And the mighty giant stumbled and staggered and fell face down in the ground. And if you're squeamish, squeamish, don't look at this picture because then David drew Goliath's sword and he chopped off his head. The giant was dead. David had won the victory in the name of the Lord. And when the Philistines saw it, they all ran away and the Israelites were able to chase after them. David had won this great victory for the Israelites that day. Goliath uh, was not uh, too much for him because he was able to fight in the name of the Lord. He trusted in the Lord to help him. Well, that's what happened then. And of course, uh, years later, God sent his son into the world as a mighty king, as a mighty warrior like David to fight against an even mightier giant than Goliath because the Lord Jesus came into the world to deal with the devil, to destroy the devil and to set us free from the devil's grip so that we might come into Jesus' kingdom. And we're going to hear about that now as we read the, the story of David, of David and Goliath in the Bible. And, uh, but that's what we're thinking about, how David points us to Jesus who was able to beat the devil. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the way that you helped David to beat Goliath, that, that giant, all those years ago. But we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, our great King, who has won a great victory and has beaten the devil uh, so that we are set free from his grip and can come into your kingdom to be with you forever. So we thank you for the way that you helped David and we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So let's uh, read the story. You'll find it 1 Samuel chapter 17. We don't have time to read all of it. It's a long chapter. Uh, so I'm just going to read uh, part of it. We'll read the first 11 verses. And then we'll jump forward. But if you've got your Bible with you, uh, we'll uh, look now at uh, 1 Samuel 17. Oops. So 1 Samuel 17, verses 1 to 11. First of all, this is the word of the Lord. Now, Elijah the Tish... Oh, I'm looking at the wrong... That's 1 Kings, 1 Samuel. Yeah, this is God's word. Uh, now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sukkah in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Daman between Sukkah and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, wearing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of, Philist of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Well, let's uh, jump forward now to verse 38. So David has come and has offered to fight against Goliath. And in verse 38, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. 
Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bare in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, a ruddy and handsome a boy, and he, dis and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into your hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly for, towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, O king, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. And we'll end the reading there, and we thank God for his word to us this morning. Let's pray for a moment. Now, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, we're coming to this well-known uh, story of David and Goliath. Uh, but perhaps uh, in order to understand this well-known story, uh, we have to think of another story in the Bible. Let me take you back to the beginning of the Bible and to the Garden of Eden. That's where everything begins. Uh, Adam and Eve... Uh, who were God's people at that time, were in their garden, the place that God had prepared for them. And you'll remember at the center of the garden, there was the tree of life, which held out the promise of everlasting life in the presence of God. But then an enemy came into the garden. It was the serpent, who was really the devil in disguise. And he tempted Eve to take and eat the fruit from the forbidden tree, that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve listened to the voice of the serpent, and she took the forbidden fruit and ate it, and she gave some to Adam, and he ate it too. And as a result, Adam forfeited the right to eat from the tree of life. And he and his wife had to leave the garden and go out of the presence of the Lord. What should Adam have done differently? Well, God had placed him in the garden to take care of it and also to guard it, to guard it from anything like the serpent which might defile the garden. And so when confronted with the enemy, when confronted with the serpent, Adam should have driven the serpent away, but he failed to do that. And instead, he was driven out of the garden, away from the tree of life. But you remember uh, God's promise at that time. He promised that the day was coming when the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. In, uh, in the garden, the Lord foretold the coming of the Savior who would 
come to destroy the devil and to set his people free from Satan's tyranny so that they might live with him forever. Well, that's what happened in the beginning. Uh, and 1 Samuel 17 repeats that story, but with a different ending. So what's this chapter about, 1 Samuel 17? Well, we've got God's people, the Israelites, living in the place God has prepared for them, the promised land of Canaan, uh, an Eden-like land flowing with milk and honey. And it was the place where they enjoyed the presence of God because the Lord God dwelt among them in the tabernacle. But then an enemy entered the land. The Philistines invaded the land of Israel and their champion, their mighty warrior, was this giant Goliath who, and, and perhaps significantly, wore armor made of what, do you remember? He wore armor made of bronze scales, scales like the scales of a serpent. And if the Philistines were successful, then God's people would be driven out of the promised land, just as Adam and Eve were driven out of Eden. But on this occasion, in 1 Samuel 17, a mighty king came forward who fought on behalf of God's people and who in the name of the Lord won a great victory over the serpent-like enemy who threatened God's people. David crushed the head of the giant so that his people could continue living in the promised land of Canaan where they enjoy the presence of the Lord in their midst. And by crushing the head of the giant, David foreshadowed how Jesus Christ, our King, would triumph over Satan so that all of God's people may live forever in the promised land to come where we'll enjoy the presence of God forever. So that's what this story is about because this story is a revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and it's here to teach us to trust in Christ our King for salvation and to rejoice in the victory he has won on our behalf. So let's go through this uh, chapter and I'm going to divide it up into three parts. In the first part, we're introduced to the enemy. In the second part, we're introduced to the king. And in the third part, we have the battle and its outcome. And the first part is verses 1 to 11, which I read a moment ago. Uh, we read that the Philistines have gathered their forces at uh, this place called uh, Socho in the land of Israel, which belonged to the tribe of Judah. And the Philistines were camped on one side of a valley, and the Israelites were camped on the other side. And in verse 4, we're introduced to this Philistine champion, Goliath from Gath. We're told about his height. He was over nine feet tall. We're told about his armor and how he wore a bronze helmet and he wore this coat of bronze scales and he had a bronze coverings on his legs. And then we're told about his weapons, this uh, bronze javelin which was slung on his back. Though some of the commentators suggest that this was actually a curved sword and then there was his spear with an iron point. So uh, this was the Philistine champion, and the champion was appointed to fight on behalf of his uh, army. So instead of sending, sending every man out to fight in a bloody battle, which would have led to many, many casualties, one man from each side was to be chosen to fight one another, and uh, the winner takes all. That's Goliath's proposal in verse 8. Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And so he challenged the Israelites to choose a man to fight him. But of course, Israel had already uh, chosen a man for such occasions, hadn't they? They had chosen uh, Saul. He was uh, tall, wasn't he? Uh, head and shoulders above the rest of the Israelites. That's how he was described when we first met Saul. And they had chosen Saul to go out before them and to fight their battles for them. 
And that's what the Israelites asked for back in chapter 8 when they asked for a king. But look at verse 11, if you've got your Bible open, where it tells us that on hearing Goliath's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So Saul didn't want to go out and fight Goliath. He was as dismayed and terrified as the rest of his men. Before moving on, look at how Goliath taunted the Israelites. He said in verse 10, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Uh, the word translated defy means scorn or mock. So he wasn't afraid of the Israelites at all. He only wanted to, to mock them and taunt them like this. Well, the second part is verses 12 to 37 where we're introduced to Israel's king. Uh, Israel's king, of course, uh, isn't Saul, uh, though Saul still sat on the throne. Uh, but do you remember chapter 16? We studied it two weeks ago. God had taken his spirit from Saul, and he had sent his spirit on David, because David had been chosen and anointed to be king of God's people in place of Saul. So while Saul remained on the throne, the true king, the one, no one knew it yet, but the true king was David. And in verse 17, the narrator introduces us to David as if we've never encountered him before. And so we're reminded that David was the son of Jesse, who was from Bethlehem. And we're reminded that Jesse had eight sons in total. Uh, David was the youngest uh, but then we're told that three of the sons, the three oldest sons, were soldiers in Saul's army. David wasn't a soldier at that time. Uh, now in Numbers chapter 1, uh, we're told that only those men who were aged 20 and over could serve in the Lord's army. And so since David wasn't yet a soldier, then that suggests to us that he was only a teenager at this time. And we're told in verse 15, that he went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep. He went back and forth from Saul because in chapter 16 we read how he had been appointed to play music for Saul whenever Saul was troubled by that uh, harmful spirit. And we read in verse 17 that uh, his father, Jesse, sent David to the battlefield to bring his brothers and their commanders some food and to bring word back to Jesse on how uh, they were doing. And so David went to the battlefield, and he heard Goliath's challenge to the men of Israel. And presumably he saw how frightened the Israelites were. And then we hear in verse 25 of how Saul offered a great reward to the man who was prepared to go and fight Goliath on their behalf. If only there was someone... If only there was someone who would go out and face the giant on their behalf. Is there someone who will go? Is there anyone who will go? Well, it turns out that there is because David is prepared to go. And look how he regards uh, Goliath because he refers to Goliath in verse 26 as this uncircumcised Philistine. Now, that's how Saul's son, Jonathan, referred to the Philistines in chapter 14. Uh, the Israelites, of course, they were the circumcised, whereas the Philistines were the uncircumcised. And that's significant because circumcision was a sign of God's promise. God's promise to be the God of his people and to take care of them always. So David knew that God was on their side, the side of the Israelites, because they were the circumcised, they were God's people, and he knew that God was against the Philistines because they were the uncircumcised, and they were not God's people. And so, uh, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is, that he should scorn and mock and defy the armies of the living God? That's what David said. It seems to David that Goliath has insulted not just the Israelites, but he's insulted the Lord their God. We'll take a look at verse 28 now, where we see how David's brother despised him. It says that uh, his brother burned with anger against David, and he spoke harshly to him. 
Well, that foreshadows how the Lord Jesus was despised and rejected by those he came to save. And take a look at verse 33 now, where we see Saul's skepticism. In verse 33, Saul said to David, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. He doubted David's ability to save, just as many doubted the ability of the Lord Jesus to save his people. But David isn't worried because in the fields, when looking after his father's sheep, he's had to fight against wild animals. In the past, he killed both the lion and the bear. And so the uncircumcised Philistine will be just like them because he has defied the armies of the living God. As far as David was concerned, the Lord who delivered him in the past will deliver him once more. Well, the third and final part of the story is verses 38 to 58, which includes the well-known episode of this well-known story uh, of the time when Saul gave David uh, his armor to try on. But since he wasn't used to it, David took it off and he relied instead on his sling and his stone to fight against the giant. When Goliath saw the boy, he despised him. And he cursed David. And he boasted how he would give his flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. But David boasted in the Lord, in whose name he came. The name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, and the God Goliath had insulted. In the name of the Lord, he will strike Goliath down, and he'll cut off his head. And it is David who will give the flesh of the Philistines to the birds and the beasts. And the whole army will, or the whole world will hear of it, David says. And they will know that there is a God in Israel who saves his people. It's a wonderful speech, isn't it? And uh, what makes it all the more wonderful is that every word of it was fulfilled because David stepped forward and he slung a stone at Goliath, crushing his head and causing him to fall face down. Just as uh, Dagon, the Philistine god, fell face down before the ark of the Lord back in chapter 5. And so David, God's anointed king, triumphed over this serpent-like enemy using only a sling and a stone. And taking Goliath's own sword, he cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they ran for the lies while the Israelites chased after them with a shout of victory. The chapter ends with Saul asking his commander, whose son is that young man? And this puzzles some of the commentators. It's maybe puzzled you because it seems as if Saul doesn't know who David is. Even though Saul met David back in chapter 16 and he spoke to him on the battlefield. But of course, he's not asking who David is. He's asking about his father. Because hasn't, hadn't he promised in verse 25 to exempt the victor's father from having to pay taxes in Israel? That's why he was asking about the father. But maybe also he was asking, who is his father? Because he looks at David and sees there's somebody who might be a rival to the throne. Well, there you are. Uh, God's people were dismayed and they were terrified because they were unable by themselves to stand up uh, to this serpent-like enemy who had invaded the promised land and who threatened to remove them from it. But God's anointed king was able to win a great victory over the enemy on their behalf so that all of God's people could continue to live in the promised land of Canaan. In the promised land of Canaan, uh, they would enjoy the presence of the Lord who dwelt among them. Whereas Adam failed to drive away the enemy who had invaded the Garden of Eden, David was able to crush the head of Goliath and drive away the Philistines who had invaded the land of Canaan. And by his victory over Goliath, David foreshadowed uh, the even greater victory which Christ our King has won over Satan, our enemy. When he was on the earth, the Lord Jesus was able to withstand all the temptations and attacks of the devil who came at him with his, 
with his wicked schemes. And the Lord Jesus was able to overpower Satan's demons and set free those who were possessed by them with, with just a word. He sent them away and the demons were terrified of the Lord Jesus. And because he was obedient to his father, even unto death on the cross, the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead and he ascended to heaven to receive the Holy Spirit whom he sends down into the world to set his people free from Satan's tyranny and to bring them by faith and repentance into his own kingdom of grace. And as members of his kingdom, we wait for the day when Christ the King will come again because when he comes again with glory and with power, he will crush the devil forever so that his people will be able to live in perfect peace and rest in the place God has prepared for us, which is the new heavens and the new earth, where we'll enjoy the presence of God forever. Do you remember the saying of the Lord Jesus in Mark chapter 3 about the strong man whose house is full of possessions? He was referring to the devil. And in a sense, the world is his house because this fallen world is under the devil's control. And he deceives the nations of the world and he blinds the minds of unbelievers everywhere to keep them from knowing and worshiping the, the true God. He's taken possession of this fallen world and unbelievers everywhere do his will. But the Lord Jesus is the even stronger man who came into the world to overcome Satan and to plunder his house and to set Christ's people free. By ourselves, by ourselves, we cannot stand up to Satan just as the Israelites couldn't stand up to Goliath. But Christ our King has won the victory on our behalf. And we now know that Satan is a defeated enemy and that one day our Savior will come to crush him and to destroy him forever. And until that day comes, Christ our King anoints his people with the same spirit who anointed him to enable us to stand up to the devil's wicked schemes in the strength of the Lord our God. He enables us more and more to withstand the wicked schemes of the devil and to resist his temptations so that instead of doing what the devil wants, we're able more and more to do what God wants. And though the devil will try to make us stumble, we have the help of Christ's own spirit to stand firm in the faith and to remain faithful to our Savior always. The Bible tells us that the devil is like a roaring lion, like a mighty giant. But if you trust in Christ the Savior, then you don't need to be afraid of the devil because he has been bound by Christ your King. And even though he may appear at times to be a roaring lion, Christ our King is stronger by far, and he has bound this roaring lion. And so you should keep trusting in Christ your King, and you should look to him for help each day, because he gives you his spirit to stand up to the devil's temptations and to do God's will here on earth. You should look to Christ the King, to help you to stand firm in the faith and to remain faithful to him always until Christ your king comes again to crush the devil forever and to bring you, if you trust in Jesus Christ the king, to bring you into the life to come where you will enjoy perfect peace and rest and safety in the presence of your God forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our mighty King who came into the world and who withstood every single one of the devil's wicked schemes. And we thank you, Lord God, that uh, because he was obedient to you, even unto death and the cross, you raised him from the grave, you exalted him to heaven, where he received the Spirit, the Spirit that he sends upon us, to enable us to receive the salvation that he won for us. 
and he sets us free from Satan's tyranny. And he makes us members of his own kingdom of grace where there's freedom and, and life and hope. And Lord God, we thank you that we can look to Christ our King for the help of his spirit every day to fight against the devil's temptations and to stand firm against all of his wicked schemes. We ourselves are so very weak. And we know that the devil is, is like a mighty giant. He's like a roaring lion. But we thank you that we can trust in Christ our Savior. So will you help us to trust in Christ our Savior, our great King every day? Will you guard us and protect us? Will you enable us to remain faithful until that day when Christ our King comes again and crushes and destroys the devil once and for all and brings us into your presence to be with you forever? So will you help us? For we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. We're going to stand again and we're going to sing See What a Morning. It'll be one of these videos on the screen, so we'll sing along to it. But let's stand to sing. This is God's charge. We should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.